Recently, I was invited onto a podcast by Dr. Simon Southerton. He is a geneticist. He is doing some science outreach to Mormons, the Mormon Stories podcast. Outreach like this, I feel, is really important because a lot of times people who are highly religious don't often have a chance to get exposed to science in the way that other groups of people do. Members of the Mormon Church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, typically are pretty well educated, but oftentimes there is hesitation among church members to learn about things like evolution, origin of life research, and secular scientific explanations for the formation of planets and stars and so on. I was invited to come on and talk about the origin of life with Dr. William M. White. This guy is an extremely decorated scientist. I suppose you could say. He's had a long career studying the formation of our planet. He's authored several books on geology and on radiometric dating. I was very honored to be able to do a tag team lesson with him. There is a link down in the video description for you to see the entire podcast, but I just wanted to share two little clips with you. One from Bill, from Dr. William White, where he describes how stars and planets form how our planet formed. The second clip is my part where I go into origin of life research. Without further ado, here is Dr. William White explaining how stars and then planets form. Stars form in gas-rich regions, one of which, at least in the, if you're in the northern hemisphere and in the winter sky, you can see the constellation Orion at night. Looks like a kite. It's actually a saber, but I think of the tail and its kite. If you look down, it's the second star down. It's fuzzy because it's not a star. It's a nebula. It's a, it's a region of dense gas where stars are forming. So you get these regions of dense gas that are sort of semi-stable because the gas is turbulent and these sorts of things, but it, there's a whole lot of gravity in here. So parts of the gas start to collapse in under themselves under gravity. The gas begins to spin, pulls itself tighter and tighter into a star. And also with a, basically, uh, you could think of it sort of as a, as a ring, sort of like Saturn about it, except not, not really a ring. It's actually a, a disk of gas at that point. And we can see with Hubble Space Telescope, looking into that, that Orion Nebula, you can actually see these stars being born. These regions with this gas disk, in some cases, a star just beginning to peek out through that dense disk of gas. And almost all the matter in this spinning disk of gas gets ultimately pulled in to form the star, but not all of it. And the leftovers form planets. Okay. And in some cases, I, I'm, I don't hold me to this, I think it's the star Beta Pictoris. We can actually see a planet looks like it's beginning to carve out a clearing in the disk. And the inner parts of these disks are very hot because they're being compressed as the gas is being pulled out. There's radiation from the new star starting to, to heat everything up too. So they're very mm -hmm. hot. Well, planets in the inner part of these disks, like the Earth, Mars, Venus, Mercury, end up with not very much gas. Remember that, that everything in the universe is mostly hydrogen and helium, and then following that's oxygen and, and, uh, and, and carbon, things that form gases. Inner planets don't get their share of these gases. So they're mo mostly rocky and iron. The outer ones where things were cooler, uh, you could get water ice to condense out around uh, the, the orbit of Jupiter. That allowed those planets to grow more rapidly because the, the you know, ice particles are, are basically dust, they're solid. Uh, they pull together the gas and you form these outer planets uh, much earlier. So, so basically that's how it happens. The sun itself is mostly hydrogen and helium. Is that because those particles have less inertia so they're able to collapse into the star? while the other things get left behind? Or is the sun itself also made of the same stuff that Earth is, but also just a bunch of it, gas? The reason is that hydrogen and helium don't condense very well, okay? It's not a matter of momentum. The cloud of gas and dust that ultimately formed the solar system basically had the composition of the sun because almost all the mass of the solar system is in the sun. It's just in the inner planets because these gases don't condense into solids, things like hydrogen and helium uh, carbon is mostly carbon monoxide. Uh, 
uh, most of the oxygen, well, the oxygen actually does condense, condense to form silicates, um, but nitrogen doesn't condense either. So we end up with not our share of these gaseous things, these elements. We are ended up with things like silicates and, and calcium, magnesium, iron, these heavier elements that like to form solids. On the outer part of the solar system where things are cooler, Jupiter almost has the same composition of the sun. It's a little richer in really. the sun. It's a little richer in some of the heavier elements, but it's got almost its full share of the nebular gas that was warm. But the inner planets, we just got the things that condense at, at high temperature. That's interesting. And, okay. and we're still leaking off helium and hydrogen that escapes, right? Yes, particularly helium. Hydrogen, most of the hydrogen in the atmosphere is tied up in its waters, but we are leaking helium, as it turns out. That clip from Dr. White's presentation was awesome. He gave us a bird's eye view of how our star, or the sun, and our solar system formed from a cloud of elements formed by exploding stars, which were formed by the Big Bang, that model, of course, will be updated as new information is discovered, but scientists are pretty confident that we do understand at least the basic outline of how our solar system formed. Now we're going to move on to something a little bit less well understood, the origin of life. This cell here, this is mycoplasma, mycoides. This thing is one of the simplest organisms on the planet. This is an illustration by David Goodsell, and he does these amazing illustrations where he he's showing you all of the macro molecules. So like water molecules and stuff he ignores, but so these we're seeing the the DNA is in yellow here, these yellow strings. You have the ribosome, which is the thing that translates genes into protein. Those are the uh, globs in pink there. And then there's little little pink strings coming out of those globs. Those are, are going into those globs. Those are chains of RNA. This is one of the simplest organisms on our planet. Now, you have, you have other things that a lot of people consider to be alive, like viruses and even viroids, which are far simpler than this. But they depend on a cell that's at least this complicated in order to reproduce. Kind yeah. of cheating to say that they represent truly simpler forms of life. I mean, this is basically as simple as we can go. This is an independent living organism. So the, the virus is cheat by hacking into these cells and right. exploiting their inner workings. Yeah. So COVID, COVID is not a, it's a cheating organism. Right. Right. It's not, so, it can't reproduce itself. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah, it needs, it needs us to, to reproduce. I suppose you could say we're, yeah. we're cheating too. Cause we, uh, we have to eat stuff. We have yeah. to eat other <laughs> organisms to survive, but plants, there yeah. are lots of plants that are, you could say, nearly fully independent because they're photosynthesizing. They do, they do need like nitrogen fixation, which they get from bacteria and so on. But uh, the, the big mystery for the origin of life is how on earth did you get something this complex with all of these cooperating parts from the chaos, far more chaotic chemical reactions and so on that we see elsewhere in the solar system. And it, if you look at a cell, so far as we can tell, everything, it's just a chemical system. Everything is physics and chemistry, just interacting in a very specific way, but it's physics and chemistry. Well, how do you get the more chaotic physics of the universe to form something this insanely complicated? They possess and maintain hundreds of essential genes. An essential gene is one where if you knock it out, the whole cell will die. They control thousands of distinct chemical reactions in their metabolism. They're actively controlling those chemical reactions. They sense and they respond appropriately to many environmental cues. They build and depend on complex proteins and ribozymes. These are molecular machines. And they use the genetic code. We do know of two hypothetical processes that are capable of generating complexity like this. So an engineer or a team of engineers could hypothetically produce something like this. It's never happened yet, actually. We've, we've been able to reproduce cells from scratch but we haven't been able to like design them on our own from the bottom up and, and get them working and then the other process is evolution by natural selection editors note a lot of times when i talk about the origin of life i present these two possibilities and because of that people have asked me if i am an intelligent design advocate the answer is no the intelligent design movement is it's quackery 
more specifically, the current form of intelligent design, the stuff that's marketed by the Discovery Institute and so on, it really is garbage. These people are not serious thinkers. Some of them do have degrees and they do good science elsewhere, but the Discovery Institute is not promoting real science. Of course, it's possible that life was engineered. There actually are serious groups such as SETI that are trying to find real ways to actually investigate this possibility. But the intelligent design movement, they're not actually doing any research. They have never done a single investigation into how the supposed engineer that they believe in actually went about engineering stuff. They have done absolutely zero research trying to investigate the nature of this supposed engineer. Meanwhile, origin of life researchers have done an incredible amount of research investigating the process of evolution and exactly how it could have worked on the early Earth. Real scientists care about the actual nature of the process that gave rise to life, and they care about how that process unfolded step by step. And I'm going to present some of their research here in a moment. We do know of two hypothetical processes that are capable of generating complexity like this. So an engineer or a team of engineers could, hypothetically, and then the other process is evolution by natural selection. The process of evolution can generate incredible complexity. The problem is, in order for evolution to get going, you need something that can replicate, and you need something that can have variation when it replicates, and that variation needs to be heritable. So replication plus heritable variation plus selection equals open-ended Darwinian evolution. And I've simplified things a little bit here. In order to get open-ended Darwinian evolution, the amount of variation that you have per generation or per replication, there's kind of a sweet spot. And that sweet spot depends on how complex the replicator is. So if it's a really complex replicator, if you get too much variation, the thing can completely break if there's too much variation in each generation, each uh, replication event. The simpler it is, the more variation it can withstand. There's some complications here, but essentially we need to start. Our starting point has to be a replicator that can then be acted upon by natural selection. Once you get that, you can get Darwinian evolution to spiral out of control and create all sorts of complex things like cells and eventually people that have podcasts and so on. But you need a replicator to start with. The ultimate goal in origin of life research, this is the, the, the white whale that everyone's after. We want to be able to find the simplest possible chemical systems that are capable of open-ended evolution. And how simple do those systems need to be? They need to be so simple that we could consider them to be prebiotically plausible, that they could have gotten kickstarted on the early earth without any other sort of guiding thing, right? We talked about amino acids being simple enough to be produced in meteorites. We're finding them in meteorites. We're also finding all sorts of sugars and uh, nucleobases, other building blocks of life that we used to think were so complex that only cells could build them. We're finding those in meteorites. And there's a, a new little field of physics that's budding right now. I'm not sure that it'll actually take off, but it's called assembly theory. Assembly theory is where people are trying to look at the complexity of a molecule or a system and determine how likely that is to pop up by chance in a specific environmental condition. The systems that most scientists are studying right now for the origin of life appear to be still, they're a lot simpler than modern cells, but they're still too complex. But there are two main candidates. We have cyclical reactions or proto-metabolism. So these are reactions that are similar to what we find inside of cells. So you've got molecule A that interacts with molecule B to produce molecule C. And then molecule C turns around and, produce and interacts with molecule B to produce molecule A. So you have this cyclical reaction where the molecules are cooperating to build each other. One of the ideas being investigated, and you know, some people think this is a really promising line of, of research, others are more doubtful, but is some suspect that you could actually get these metabolic reactions to undergo a form of Darwinian evolution and eventually give rise to open-ended evolution. The other big 
most promising candidates are polymers. Polymers are chain-like molecules. So we, we saw that amino acid earlier. It was that, that, uh, that one fairly simple molecule. Well, a bunch of those can be linked together into a chain, what we call a polymer. And you can have different types of amino acids linked into a chain. And that polymer can do all sorts of complicated things. Uh, RNA is another chain-like molecule. It's, it's made of little building blocks that we call nucleotides. And we do have an animation to watch. Stated Clearly presents, what is the RNA world hypothesis? If you were to go back in time 120 million years, you'd find yourself in a dinosaur world. 500 million years ago was a world of trilobites and other strange sea creatures. 3.4 billion years ago was the world of the first living cells. And if you were to go back further still, scientists suspect that chains of a chemical called RNA, or something similar to RNA, kickstarted this entire beautiful mess that we call life. RNA is thought to have given rise to life for several reasons. Chains of RNA are found abundantly in all living cells today. RNA is a close chemical cousin to DNA. And with very little help from researchers, RNA chains can replicate, evolve, and interact with their environments. While many details have yet to be worked out, the RNA world hypothesis is the simple idea that somewhere on our early planet, perhaps in a tide pool or hot spring, the Earth's chemistry was producing random chains of RNA. Once formed, they began replicating, evolving, and competing with each other for survival. As these chains evolved and diversified, some eventually began cooperating to produce the genetic code, a wide array of complex proteins, and even living cells which, from the perspective of RNA, can actually be thought of as houses or survival machines for RNA to live inside. To understand how RNA chains can interact with their environments, replicate, and evolve, we first need to understand the simple process of base pairing. Chains of RNA are made of nucleotides, small molecules that come in four different types labeled A, C, U, and G. The backbone atoms of a nucleotide, shown here as a yellow bar, can form strong chemical bonds with the backbone atoms of any other RNA nucleotide. This means that different chains can have completely different sequences from left to right. The parts we call the bases of nucleotides, the colored sections labeled A, C, U, or G, are attracted to other bases sort of like a magnet, but they're selective about who they will stick to. G selectively pairs with C, A selectively pairs with U. When bases find their matches and stick together, we call it base pairing. Researchers have found that with a little bit of assistance, Base pairing allows chains of RNA to replicate and evolve. Here's how it works. When a long chain of RNA is suspended in cool water with high concentrations of free nucleotides, the chain can act as a template for its own replication. Nucleotides automatically base pair with their partners on the existing chain. If their backbone atoms form chemical bonds with each other, and by the way, this is the part that currently requires assistance from researchers, we're not yet sure how this would have happened in the wild, a complementary RNA strand is born, one with the exact inverse sequence of the original. If the water is then heated, paired bases lose their grip, allowing both chains to act as templates when the cycle repeats. The great thing about this process is that every other RNA chain produced is a copy of the original, but sometimes mutations slip in. This means that as chains compete for survival and reproduction, true evolution, descent with modification, acted upon by selection, can operate on chains of RNA. As amazing as replication is, base pairing also gives RNA chains a second special ability. When placed in water cool enough for base pairing, but without enough free nucleotides for replication, chains will fold up and base pair with themselves. The end result is a complex shape with certain sticky bases pointing outward because they weren't able to find partners. These sticky, outward-facing bases can cause unique chemical reactions by interacting with other molecules in their environment. A folded chain of RNA capable of guiding a specific chemical reaction is what we call a ribozyme. Some ribozymes break certain molecules apart. Others join certain molecules together. A ribozyme's specific function is determined by its specific shape, and its shape is determined by its sequence. 
If a mutation changes a ribozyme sequence, the shape can be modified and so can its function. When ribozymes were first discovered, scientists wondered how difficult it would be for random chains of RNA to evolve legitimate survival functions. Imagine, for example, a ribozyme that could build nucleotides out of molecules it finds in its environment. Across multiple generations, natural selection could promote and refine this ribozyme because the chain would tend to have access to more free nucleotides than its rivals, allowing it to replicate more often. To explore this idea, researchers at Simon Fraser University produced a large group of random RNA chains and examined them to see if any happened to be able to make nucleotides. Surprisingly, some actually could, but they weren't very efficient. Researchers selected out the successful chains and then used a lab technique called PCR to quickly replicate them with slight random mutations. After just 10 rounds of PCR, followed by selection, highly efficient nucleotide-building ribozymes evolved. These are molecules with the lifelike ability to actively participate in their own survival. These ribozymes, and many others produced through similar experiments, are beginning to blur the line between living things and simple chemistry. So to sum things up, the RNA world hypothesis is the simple idea that the first things to replicate and evolve on our planet may have been chains of RNA or something similar to them. While the basic idea of the RNA world does seem to give us a promising pathway to the origin of life, it's still very much a work in progress. As mentioned, one of several unsolved problems is, how did nature get backbone binding to function without the special enzymes or lab techniques we use today? While many researchers continue to focus on RNA, others are investigating alternative molecules, chemical systems that might replicate and evolve without assistance and could have given rise to RNA. Continual breakthroughs are being found in both avenues of research. I'm John Perry, and that's the RNA World Hypothesis stated clearly. Well, there you have it, folks. That's it for my little clip here. Down in the video description, I have a link to the entire podcast. We talk about a lot more stuff. We talk about the Big Bang. Dr. White goes over what degree of certainty do we really have about the things that we think we know about the Big Bang which is a really interesting part that I didn't show here. It's great. Go check it out. The first chunk of it is going over Mormon theology, which might not be super interesting to all viewers. So I've got a link also that starts with when the science stuff starts. So look for that down in the video description. It's labeled. You'll see it. Enjoy.